Politics affects lives, and politics are complicated. But politics also behave very much like games. You have winners and losers, rules and conventions, designers and players. And though politics may not be our primary expertise, games are something we know very well. So in this little mini-series, we are going to use gaming terminology and concepts to help break down and explain the game. Welcome to Extra Politics. When a particular topic or issue is very important to us, we naturally want to spend more time talking about it. But in the world of politics, that's not always the best strategy. And today, I'm going to explain why using two gaming terms, points and actions. In games, points are frequently used to determine a winner. Whoever has the most points wins. In politics, and more specifically in elections, the points come from you and me in the form of our votes. In presidential elections, it gets a little bit squishier because of state electors and whatnot, but basically it still comes down to our votes. Now, in game design, points come in two different flavors. There are gimmies, and there are marginal points. Gimmies are points that you can't help but get. They just happen as you play. For example, in Ticket to Ride, scoring fewer than 50 points would actually take focused effort. It's quite hard to do. So in this case, we could say that Ticket to Ride gives roughly 50 gimme points, and the rest are marginal points. And since all of the players are going to be getting those gimme points, that means that games are won and lost on marginal points. Score the most marginal points, and you win. In our highly politicized American system, the majority of votes are actually gimmies. At least 80% of regular GOP voters are going to vote for whoever the GOP candidate is, as will the regular Democrat voters. So those votes are gimmies. Your vote might be a gimme as well. This means that to win elections, candidates must focus their efforts on the marginal points, meaning the people who haven't decided who they want to vote for yet, or who might not bother to vote at all. And the way candidates fight for these marginal points is by spending time addressing those particular voters. You can think of it like taking actions in a game. In many games, players have a list of possible actions they can take, but they must choose how to spend those actions each turn. For example, imagine a game where on your turn, you can trade goods, collect resources, build new buildings, or fight a battle, but you only get two action points. You can do any one of those things, but you won't be able to do all of those things in a single turn. You're gonna have to make some choices. This exact same dynamic applies in politics. A candidate might choose to spend their action points making calls to influential businesses, or going on a tour of schools in their district, or preparing for a debate. But which to choose? In US politics, winning the game is priority number one. After all, if a candidate loses the election, they're not going to be able to achieve any of the goals or changes they have planned. And when you look at politics from that perspective, a lot of politicians' actions start to make a lot more sense. Everything hinges on winning elections. There is no higher priority. It may not be very inspirational, but it is practical. And so the real challenge as a politician becomes figuring out which path to victory will allow you to achieve at least some of the good things you want to accomplish. Losing is losing, but in politics there are degrees of victory. For example, you could win by taking huge amounts of lobbyist money to dramatically outspend your opponent, but that might leave you trapped for an entire term doing the bidding of those lobbyists who helped you win, while your own agenda collects dust in a corner. Politics is a tricky game. Let's run through an example scenario involving a specific political issue. It could be any, but let's say civil rights. Civil rights is the fight for equal treatment under the law and in daily life. Sometimes it's a defensive battle to ensure that people keep the rights they have. And sometimes it's a proactive battle, like fighting for people who do not currently enjoy equal status. Proactive civil rights movements in the U.S. started by addressing large populations, such as the fights to get women and African Americans the right to vote. More recent movements have largely addressed smaller populations. The long struggle for gay marriage rights led to a victory that directly affected a lot of people, but a smaller number than was impacted by the suffragette movement, for example. 
Now, obviously, just because a smaller percentage of the population is suffering an injustice does not make the fight for those civil rights any less important or morally right. Civil rights is an issue that is very important to us here. But for the specific purposes of this video, and to better understand the political game, let's put the morality aside for just a moment and look at civil rights purely in the context of winning elections. Let's look at this graph. Let's say that this circle represents a single issue, and the colors represent all the voters who care about that issue. The red chunk represents conservative voters, the blue represents liberals, and the orange chunk surrounding it represents all the marginal voters. As you probably have already guessed, those red and blue votes in the middle? Those are the gimmies. They are important votes, but in terms of political strategy, those votes might as well not even be in play. They're pretty much unchangeable. So let's just remove those from the board for now. That delectable orange circle remaining? Those are the marginal votes. The undecided. The might not vote at alls. These are the votes that each candidate stands to win if they invest actions addressing this particular issue circle. But that's just one issue. One of many. Let's bring the other issues in here, and just the orange marginal voter chunks with all of the gimmies removed. This right here? This is the real game board. As a politician in a democracy, this is how you view an election. Granted, in real life, few voters fit entirely into just one circle, but let's keep this simple for now. As a politician, you can spend an action to address one of those circles, telling that particular group of marginal voters where you stand on their issue and, on a more esoteric level, acknowledging that their issue is important to you. Even if you don't offer up a solution or a plan for that issue, you are still showing those voters that you get them by acknowledging that their issue is important. Now, candidates would love to address each and every issue on this board, but action points are limited. You've only got so many turns and so many resources, so tough calls have to be made. And while sometimes candidates invest action points on their gimmies in the hope that the gimmies start performing action points on their own, the fact remains that elections are won and lost on the marginal voters, so that has to be the focus. There are many common strategies for spending these action points in an election. For example, strategy number one, target the largest marginal voter circles. This one's a classic. Is the economy lagging? Well, then spend some action points addressing the economy. I mean, hey, everybody's affected by the economy, and that means a lot of marginal votes ripe for the picking. Strategy number two, grow one of the circles. If there's an issue circle where you have a particularly potent argument and a high chance of victory, you could spend some points trying to make more people care about that issue, adding more marginal votes to that circle. In the 2016 election, Donald Trump spent a lot of action points growing the previously tiny Fear of Refugees circle, because he felt that that was a circle he could easily win, and that strategy turned out to be pretty effective. But elections aren't single-player games. You are playing against opponents, and that leads to other potential strategies, like strategy number three, force your opponent to spend their action points poorly. So I mentioned civil rights before. Let's take a look at that civil rights circle and let's put the gimmies back in for a moment. Hmm, seems like most voters have their minds pretty well made up on that issue. Not a lot of marginal votes to be won there. If you are a liberal candidate and you look at this circle, you will most likely deduce that this is not a very smart place to spend your action points. Of course, civil rights may be incredibly important to you, but you need to be pursuing marginal votes if you are going to win this thing and be able to do anything. Okay, but what if you're a conservative candidate? At first, you might look at this and think, yikes, barely any marginal votes and the liberals have this circle on lock. Not even worth trying. But wait, what if you were to spend a few action points here by, say, taking an opposing stance to a current civil rights movement? Whether you do that directly by, say, supporting a bathroom bill, or indirectly through dog whistle tactics, you might manage to shock the liberal majority of gimmies in that circle, who will then demand a liberal response. Hey, they'll shout, are you gonna let them get away with that? And this will pull in the liberal candidate and force them to spend some action points on a circle they already had in the bag. The end result? You spent one or two action points on this issue, but the liberal candidate was forced to spend dozens in response, and all of that over a tiny sliver of marginal votes. This strategy often looks pretty absurd from the outside, but in the world of politics, attacking where your opponent is strong can be surprisingly effective. 
Of course, there are effective ways to spend action points actually addressing civil rights. You could grow that circle by drawing more people's attention and sympathy to the issue. But, due to the shrinking number of people directly affected by modern civil rights movements, those strategies are more challenging than ever to pull off. But that leaves us in a pretty tough position. How do we reconcile the strategic imperative of winning elections with the moral imperative of fighting for an equal world, or whatever your personal pet issue might be? Well, luckily, elections aren't the only battlefield in politics. The United States of America isn't a sit-down-and-shut-up-you-lost kind of democracy. We are in this 24-7. Even outside the election cycle, a civil rights activist can always push whoever is in office to take action. Exactly how to go about this will probably require a few more episodes to cover. I hope that you've enjoyed this look at American politics through the lens of game design, and I hope that you will join us for the rest of this little series. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.